Hello, greetings from the Bonehenge Whale Center in Beaufort, North Carolina. Seems like an appropriate place to develop a presentation about our local bottlenose dolphins. I'm hoping Bonehenge will be open for public programming and tours sometime in 2020, but that's not a promise and maybe I'll cover that in a different presentation. Now I want to present to you about our local bottlenose dolphins that have taught us a lot in the last 30 something years. I'd like to cover some of that for you. My name is Keith Rittmaster. I'm the natural science curator at the North Carolina Maritime Museum in Beaufort. Whoa. Uh -oh. Hope he doesn't bite. In the next uh, oh, maybe 30 minutes or so, I'll cover all these topics very briefly as they relate to our bottlenose dolphins. And for starters, I just want to introduce you to something that is pretty mind blowing to me that we have discovered uh, pretty recently. And that is the diversity of whales that we have documented in North Carolina waters. This poster, represents all, approximately all the known species of whales on the globe as of about 10 years ago when it was published. And all of the baleen whales are facing toward me to the right. And all the toothed whales are facing away from me toward the left. So the biggest toothed whale on top right is a sperm whale. But this slide's about to get messy and this is kind of my point. I'm gonna circle all of the species that we've documented in Noina. And there they are, and there are 34 of them, and that's more than any other state in the nation. Uh, so I just wanted to present to you that uh, sort of optimistic fact, and I'm not bragging, I would work hard to prove me wrong, but I think we have a world-class whale diversity here in North Carolina. The gray whale has an X, through it because it clearly was in the North Atlantic and it became extinct presumably from hunting pressure in the 1700s. But all I'm gonna talk about for the rest of this is the one circled there, bottlenose dolphin, Terciops truncatus, technically a small toothed whale. I want to go over just a few terms that I'll be using just so you're familiar in case I slip into some scientific jargon. The tail, also called the flukes. I might say the dolphin raised its flukes before it dove. That's a common behavior. Pectoral fins, they have two of them, also called flippers. Dorsal fin, you're about to hear more about a dorsal fin than you ever wanted to know. Uh, blowhole, unlike you and I and terrestrial mammals, uh, they cannot breathe through their mouth. All of their exchange occurs through the blowhole. Beak or rostrum are terms used interchangeably when referring to the tip of the snout. And the melon is an interesting organ between the rostrum and the blowhole. I think most people agree that its primary function is to focus and amplify sound. Their world is sound much like ours is vision. And uh, well, it's interesting. Uh, if you go to SeaWorld and you see a dolphin open its mouth and talk, it's doing that likely for one of two reasons. One, because you and I, the tourist, will pay more money to see a cute dolphin talk or because it's begging for food. They don't need to open their mouths to make their sounds. They don't have vocal cords. It kind of sounds like a dolphin. I'm just squishing air under my tongue and dolphins squish air back and forth in nasal sinuses near the blowhole to create most of the sounds that they use. I just want to mention that because I'm going to play a sound clip for you in a, uh, in a few minutes and I want you to have a little bit of understanding about how the sound is used and created. And a picture of a dolphin taking a breath. The blowhole is open. And one thing I've been learning about uh, imagine uh, might be news to some people is that uh, in North Carolina, dolphins used to be hunted. 
harvested. Uh, it was referred to in historic and scientific literature uh, as the porpoise fishery. And I just want you to know that they weren't porpoises and they aren't fish. I refer to it as the dolphin fishery uh, and they're mammals. And as far as I can tell from the photos I'm presenting here and from all the documentation that states they were porpoises, I don't think any porpoises were taken in this netting and harpooning activity. And I believe uh, the only mammals that were taken um, were bottlenose dolphins, but often referred to as porpoises. And netting was one way of harvesting them, harpooning was another. And again, a good look, I, there's no question about it. These are bottlenose dolphins, not porpoises. Uh, and this is near the peak of the uh, activities. And this wasn't just North Carolinians harvesting these dolphins for subsistence. Uh, people from New England came down, set up camp to kill North Carolina's dolphins. People from Europe came over, set up camp to kill North Carolina's dolphins. John Hare, an educator and historian at the Maritime Museum, told me that the most lucrative product in the entire global whaling industry per ounce was the lower jaw oil from North Carolina's bottlenose dolphins. John, if you see this, I hope you correct me if I'm wrong. I think I got that right. Why bottlenose dolphins? Why lower jaw oil? Why North Carolina? Uh, and there are good reasons for those. Uh, I, I, right now, I'm, I'm presenting in this slide the uses of the dolphin harvests in North Carolina, but it's the uh, the fourth bullet, the lower jaw oil, that I'm focusing on because it was so valuable. But there are many other uses uh, for it. And this is very interesting fact about that lower jaw oil. On this slide, dolphin jaw oil that I pressed out of the tissue from the lower jaw of a deceased bottlenose dolphin is on the left. And another very valuable product in the whaling industry, spermaceti from the head of a sperm whale is on the right. This is room temperature and the dolphin jaw oil is liquid and the spermaceti is hard. And I put a bunch of oil in a freezer, oil from the earth, coconut oil, olive oil, blubber oil, head oil, jaw oil. The only oil that did not get solid was the lower jaw oil of bottlenose dolphins. And this was pretty important if you wanted to lubricate guns, sewing machines, aeronautical equipment in cold climates because it wouldn't get thick in cold temperature. Uh, Swiss watches created tremendous demand for dolphin jaw oil. You don't get much oil from a dolphin, but you don't need much. It, this just shows where the, um, the locations of a dolphin kills and processing were in, in Beaufort. There's right around Beaufort where we are now is uh, four red dots. So it happened uh, right here for most of two centuries. I think it ended in the early 1900s. So I think everyone would agree that the dolphins that we see are from a population that's still recovering from this tremendous and unsustainable hunt. Picture of a dolphin blowing bubbles out of its blowhole just before it comes to take a breath. And the dorsal fin. This is the what we use to identify individual dolphins. It's a process called photo identification. The scars and notches, especially the notches that dolphins acquire on their dorsal fins, enable us to identify individuals, uh, you know, in, over many years. So this individual, the dorsal fin that you see is Zephyr. It's a dolphin that uh, we have photographed in Ocracoke once and in Beaufort just in the wintertime. And meet onion and butterfly, probably our best known pair of dolphins. Onions on the left, very distinctive fin with two big notches on the leading edge. Butterfly has a big tab and several scoops out of the back uh, near the top of the trailing edge. And we first identified them, I think in 1990, uh, but every time we saw them, they were together and we got to know them very well. 
This is 1992 on the other, and this is uh, 2011, um, so 19 years later. And they're again, uh, same dolphins, they're together side by side. Male, female, parent, offspring, couple females, couple dudes. They're adult males. And we've known this, not from our studies, as much as from other studies that have demonstrated that the most consistent, long-lasting relationship in wild bottlenose dolphin societies appears to be between adult males. Uh, sometimes they triple it up, sometimes they pair up. Gen we only see pairs around here, and onion and butterfly are a pair of males. And a lot of information here. The main thing I want you to see is the color pattern. Uh, in the, this is two pictures of onion about 19 or 20 years apart. And the colored squares are when we have photographed onion and Beaufort. The white squares are when we haven't. We go out every month of the year. And the pattern is striking. We only see onion in the cool water months, and we never see onion in the warm water months. And that's what's shown on this table. And of course, onion and butterfly and um, other dolphins that have a similar sighting pattern. Ooh, it must be summertime in Beaufort. Why? Because it's a keyhole. Unlike onion and butterfly and their associates, keyhole is a dolphin that we only see here in the summertime and never in the cool water months. In a similar plot with month over the top of the table and uh, around 20 years on the left margin shows a very distinctive sighting pattern, but very different than onions here in the warm water months, absent in the cool water months. And those two pictures are from the same dolphin. He had changed over the years, but um, it's clearly the same dolphin. We know him very well. Keyhole. Still see keyhole. Only in the summer. Put side by side, you can see the two sighting patterns that are representative of our best known dolphins. So we have winter dolphins and we have summer dolphins. We do have dolphins year round here, but as far as I can tell, um, one individual doesn't spend an entire year here. There are seasonal movements. Karen Clark at the Outer Banks Center for Wildlife Education texted me this photo. I said, Keith, it's a dead dolphin. Uh, and I heard the dorsal fin's distinctive. Stand by, I'm gonna send you a picture of the dorsal fin in case you know it. And she went and got a picture and sent it to me. And no question about it, that is Onion's life mate Butterfly, who we had known for decades, dead on the beach at Kill Devil Hills. That's a picture of Butterfly alive. And maybe you can see, look carefully, that they are the same dolphin. And Karen did a necropsy, which is an autopsy on a non human, on the beach. And in Butterfly's stomach were pieces of monofilament fishing net. Kim Murian curates a catalog called the Mid-Atlantic Bottlenose Dolphin Catalog. And uh, everyone who takes pictures of dolphins for research, I hope everyone, uh, contributes to the catalog that Kim curates. And she creates plots for us so that we can understand more about our dolphins when they're not in our area. And it's, uh, it's fascinating. And all these things I'm telling you about them, we wouldn't know this without photo identification, being able to identify an individual. So most of the um, summer dolphins that are in Beaufort spend their winters, as far as we can tell, around Wrightsville Beach, Cape Fear, and they don't seem to go much further. There are a few exceptions. And most of the dolphins that spend their winters in Beaufort, they seem to be in Beaufort in large numbers, but in the winter, but in the summertime, there seems to be a split where some of them go to Roanoke Sound, known very well by the folks associated with the uh, Nags Head Dolphin Watch and Outer Bank Center for Dolphin Research. 
and some go to Virginia Beach, known very well by folks doing similar work associated with the Virginia Aquarium. Not much of a movement, but there's a predictable seasonal component to the movement. Bonless dolphin dorsal fin. This happened to be a dead one. And a few things I wanted to highlight, point out to you is one, the scars, which are tooth rake marks from other bottomless dolphins. Seen it in the wild, seen it in captivity. They literally inflict injury and draw blood from each other with their teeth. I don't know if it's affection, aggression, communication, but I've never seen an adult dolphin that didn't have a lot of tooth rake marks from other dolphins. And then the floppy things uh, are soft barnacles called xenobalanus is the taxonomic genus. Xeno for traveler or foreigner and balanus meaning whale. They occur on many species of cetaceans and uh, we see them on bottomless dolphins, particularly in the fall. And those barnacles um, come and go. So they're not very good for photo ID. In fact, they kind of frustrate us because they are uh, they often obscure notches that would otherwise be used to identify the individual dolphin. Okay, this is the part more about a dorsal fin than you ever wanted to know. Now, what does a dorsal fin do for a bottlenose dolphin? And if you said stability, I would say you're probably right. If you said maybe steering, I'd say you're probably right. But uh, good, talented, Bright folks at UNC Wilmington have taught me that as much as anything, or more, maybe more than anything, the value of that dorsal fin to a dolphin is thermoregulation. It literally helps a dolphin dump heat or retain heat. It's very little, if any, blubber is associated with the dorsal fin. And I am taking an educated guess that this dorsal fin that you're looking at is a cool dolphin that is conserving heat because those surface veins that are very obvious going up the dorsal fin are collapsed. They are not full of blood. What the heck am I talking about? Well, I'm going to try to tell you. Imagine I cut the dorsal fin off the dolphin and I'm looking down at the body. And what becomes very evident is a lot of vascularization. There is no bones associated with the dorsal fin. And down the center of the dorsal fin are arteries surrounded by veins. And on the margins, the perimeter of the dorsal fin, just under the skin, it's a slight oversimplification, what are, are veins. And when the dolphin wants to dump heat, because it's really active, it's overheating, blood goes up the dorsal fin and the arteries and it returns on the surface um, in the veins near the surface, enabling the heat in the blood to be sucked out into the water. If it wants to retain heat, like I told you I thought this dolphin is doing, the blood returns on the internal veins that are closer to the arteries, and those peripheral veins are collapsed. I hope it makes sense. This is a real dolphin dorsal fin that I removed from a dead dolphin. I'm gonna blow up that area in the square. And there you can see precisely what I'm talking about. Near the center is the artery that's surrounded by veins and closer to the margin under the skin is a vein. And it's through this vascularization that the dolphin can maintain body temperature and body temperature in specific areas in the body. Uh, uh, we've learned, I've been taught, um, that this cooled blood from the dorsal fin in the males goes to the testes so that the testes can be cooled. They don't have scrotums, internal testes, so they need to be cooled to produce viable sperm. And in females, they are associated with maintaining um, appropriate temperature for the development of a fetus that is critical for reproduction. So there is more than you ever want on a dorsal fin. A friend of mine x-rayed a dorsal fin. So you can see that a lot of vascularization 
and no bones in the dorsal fin. And while he was at it, he x-rayed a pectoral fin, and it's right next to a human arm. And I think uh, it's often an oh wow moment when people see that uh, in a dolphin flipper, there's an upper arm bone, the humerus, lower arm bones, radius and ulna, and five digits. They're uh, very physical. Body contact is not unusual. This happens to be off Shackleford Banks, and the dolphin in the air is facing us, and the dolphin in the water is about to get a six-foot body slam from a 300-pound dolphin, enough to probably kill um, one of us. And, and yes, the airborne dolphin did land on the other dolphin, and I don't know if that's, you know, communication or aggression or affection. I have no idea. But uh, uh, sometimes we observe some pretty rough interactions. Dolphin fish, my friend Greg, is holding. Also called mahi-mahi, also called dorado. And when a fisherman tells me, Keith, we really got into the dolphins thick today, I know that they're talking about the fish. Cold-blooded, has gills, lays eggs, as opposed to the mammal dolphin. And when fishermen and the general public and some scientists see the mammal, they often refer to it as a porpoise. And I just want to clarify the difference between dolphin and porpoise for you. This is a harbor porpoise. It's the only species of porpoise we have on the East Coast. I've never seen a live one in North Carolina. A couple um, not healthy ones have come ashore, but generally what we see in North Carolina are dead porpoises, generally the month of February, typically Dare County. So this is really the southern limit. I think there might have been one or two strandings south of Cape Lookout, but generally north of us is where they strand. And north of Virginia is where they occur alive. If you want to see harbor porpoises, go up to in August or July in the Bay of Funday or the Gaspé Peninsula, and there are a lot of harbor porpoises up there. In the wintertime, they tend to move toward us, and that's when we see them stranded on our beaches. Uh, Stephanie, our graphics wizard at the Maritime Museum, created this for me, which I love, um, enabling us to easily compare externally Bonlow's dolphin, the bigger one further away, and the harbor porpoise overlaid on it, and the mahi mahi, dorado, dolphin fish. So you can see some of the differences in the dorsal fin shape, the length of the rostrum, the overall size, and of course the mahi-mahi, um, very different. Uh, and then the teeth are different as well. These are the lower jaws with the teeth installed of two subadults that we're preparing for display. Harbor porpoise on the left, flattened kind of spatula shaped teeth, and the bottlenose dolphin on the right, much larger teeth. Uh, more cone-shaped, uh, so their teeth are very different. I used to work at SeaWorld in San Diego, and while I was there, uh, one of the captive Commerson's dolphins gave birth in what we would call a breech birth, head comes out last, is typical among cetaceans, and that's what's happening here. This female dolphin is giving birth to a baby, and this is that five-day-old baby boy nursing. And just like you and I, and everything from the biggest blue whale to the small Commerson's dolphin or harbor porpoise, uh, they get most of the nutrition in the first year of life from nursing. So another mammalian characteristic, let's see, bear alive young, nursing, Warm-blooded, has lungs, breathes air. I've covered all that. There's another mammalian trait we haven't discussed yet. Hair. Mammals have hair, right? But dolphins don't have hair, do they? Well, yes, they do. When they're born, you can see hair on dolphins. And this is a, uh, a young, a neonate dolphin that came ashore dead. And you can clearly see hair on the rostrum, which is very predictable 
we don't see hair on a even a yearling dolphin but they are born with hair so uh, yes dolphins have hair another mammalian characteristic when we see a young dolphin that's next to a much larger dolphin we make an assumption that that larger dolphin not only is it a female but it's the mom and after several sightings we try to confirm that relationship or at least substantiate it uh, the young ones the neonates are uh, darker very buoyant the dorsal fin is pretty floppy and uh, we try to figure out where they give birth when they give birth and um, so we look very carefully at the newborn dolphins and the seasonality of, of the newborns the males are a little tougher to confirm what who a male is but this picture is uh, i guess a dolphin's version of mooning me where it's exposing <laughs> presenting its uh anus and genital opening such that i know that this is a male because there are two separate slits and in a female the anus and the genital opening are in one long slit not the case in this one and at the same time I got lucky and got a good picture of its dorsal fin, which happened to be distinct, and we had it in our catalog. So we were able to say, without capturing it, without biopsying it, uh, that this is a male dolphin. May not be a big deal, um, may not sound like a big deal, but it's uh, it's exciting for us. And speaking of male dolphins, uh, well, what you think you're seeing in this picture is. Uh, uh, is what you think uh, the erect penis of a male bottlenose dolphin just above my head there and mating has to occur or copulation has to occur belly to belly and when a male dolphin wants to copulate with a female i've seen it a few times in the wild and once in captivity maybe twice the male will flip upside down and try to go belly to belly with the female. If the female is not interested, not receptive, she will do what appears to be happening in this photograph. She will flip upside down and not present her belly to the male's belly, therefore thwarting his effort to copulate if she is receptive which i think is happening here the male flips upside down i believe the dolphin on top is a female i think the one in the upper right is the um associate the life mate of that male that's upside down um, and if the female is receptive she will stay upright and they will copulate i have no way of knowing if conception occurs but this is how mating um copulation occurs i hope that makes sense and wasn't too x-rated so this kind of summarizes most of uh or maybe everything that i mentioned uh my wife vicky there put this together for me to help me explain the social system where after uh, about a 12 month gestation period mom moms with babes hang out together the dads have no nothing as far as we know nothing to do with child rearing uh they don't even send checks they just uh aren't involved the young are raised with the moms and aunts and sisters and grandmothers uh in what we call nursery groups and as the young age and often these nursery groups are made up of moms with calves of approximately the same age. When they are weaned, they leave mom and join mixed sex groups, think middle school. And then as they reach sexual maturity, the males pair up, occasionally triplet up according to some studies, but we've not seen that here. Uh, but they do pair up and stay together for most of all their lives and the females there's a question mark there because we just haven't been able to document a female going back to what we believe was their um, native group with the moms and the sisters and so on 
But this sort of summarizes a, a social structure that I've tried to describe of wild bob dolphins. So when I got this report, it seemed like it might have been an opportunity for a rescue, uh, which sounded like a good thing to do. Dolphin with an inner tube around it or a plastic bag over its head. So I, I had a boat in the water. I got some volunteers. I uh, contacted Paula Gilkin of the Rachel Carson Reserve. She had a boat on the water. She helped look for what this ferry captain had reported to me. And we found it. And this is what we saw. And I really had never seen anything like this and couldn't tell what it was until I stopped the boat and zoomed up in my photos on the digital camera and I saw what became very clear. It's an adult dolphin with a calf or more likely an expelled fetus draped over her, assuming the adult is a female, rostrum. And they swam, she swam like this for the 20 or 30 minutes that I was with them. I'd never seen it before. I've seen it a few times since. Veterinarians have looked at this picture with me and they believe that there is no muscle tone in the um, offspring and that it was an expelled fetus. It had never taken a breath. Uh, the mom happened to have a very distinct dorsal and it was in her catalog. And uh, the following year, she had another neonate. So she got back into the, uh, um, into reproduction pretty soon after she lost that one. It was a very sad thing to see. Okay, this is uh, our in acoustic intermission. Uh, the schematic shows the melon that I described and the air sacs that I mentioned create the sounds. And uh, it was 17 dolphins off of Shackleford. It's important that it was winter time because there are no boats around. And so we could hear the dolphins pretty well. And it's just a cheap underwater microphone called a hydrophone. And I want you to listen for echolocation clicks, pulsed sounds, sometimes sounds like a squeaky screen door. Um, or they perceive their environment, it's believed, using echolocation, much like sonar. Listen for whistles, flowing sounds, <whistles> signature whistles occur in dolphins where a dolphin emits a certain whistle or very close to it for most of all of its life, presumably to identify itself. And in this sound clip, I think I also got what's been referred to as the Big Bang. It's always preceded by echolocation clicks. And it sounds like a distant gunshot or a cap gun. Eek. Eek. And it's been demonstrated that a dolphin can make a sound so focused and intense, it can kill or stun a fish. And I think I got some of that in this sound clip. And at the risk of you falling sound asleep, feel free to close your eyes for 20 seconds or so. That's how long the sound clip is and really listen to these sounds. Here we go. Works. Well, I call that the dolphin's greatest hits because every sound I've ever heard him make <laughs> is in that short sound clip. And uh, your assignment is to translate the whole thing into English and it's due in a week and uh, I hope you won't be late. Actually, most of those sounds, I don't think anyone has a clue what they mean. Uh, and there could be possibly some fish sounds in there as well because there are a lot of noisy fish out there. Uh, meet the North Carolina Marine Mammal Stranding Network. Uh, many of us uh, collaborate regularly and respond to every report of a dead or a dying or an entangled marine mammal, which in North Carolina can include, uh, well, up to 34 species of cetaceans, but also 
We've documented four species of seals and also manatees in North Carolina. And the organizations listed under the uh, logo are the ones that take a leadership role in the Marine Mammal Stranding Network. And this is what we typically encounter is a bottlenose dolphin dead on the beach, maybe half of the strandings or more, uh, probably more, are bottlenose dolphins. And beyond determining the cause of death or identifying and measuring, the, um, identifying the species and taking lots of measurements, more than you can imagine possible, uh, good people who are much more dedicated and talented than I am uh, do necropsies. Uh, and, and maybe determine the cause of death. In some cases, it's kind of obvious. In other cases, um, they can't. But this dolphin was severely wrapped up in monofilament fishing line, not from a net, but from a reel, and uh, to a lethal degree. This dolphin, still warm, uh, wrapped up in a monofilament gill net, along with a couple of cormorants in that net. So these are a couple of causes of death. We don't um, hunt or fish for dolphins anymore, but we sure are managing to kill them. This one came ashore on Roanoke Sound, and this is what its carcass looked like when it came ashore. I'm going to show you a close-up of the head. Clearly shows horrible entanglement and fishing line that happened to be a net because there are knots in there. And you could see that the line had actually cut into the skin and there was a lot of swelling and infection. Uh, and when we did the dissection, we were very careful to leave the sign, the, the line intact because I wanted to prepare the skull as much as possible. Um, Oh, the picture that just showed up is the pectoral fin, which is also entangled. This poor dolphin had a short, painful life. Uh, and it, it survived for about a year, according to the veterinarians, entangled, and then eventually succumbed to the entanglement. And when I took the skull out of the bacteria-laden water that I used to actually get the flesh off of it, it became an oh wow moment. And what I um, feared and sort of hoped for was to be able to demonstrate uh, what this shows, which is the chronic nature of the injury. And that is not bone being cut by line. That is bone of a fast growing young mammal that had grown around the entangling line that was killing it. Over the course of what we've estimated about a year, it became entangled while it was still nursing at around six months of age and died at about a year and a half. It's a horrible example of what a entanglement can do. Other causes of death that uh, we've documented, uh, propeller strikes. This is five propeller strike. One propeller strike took off the front of the rostrum. This happened to be a dolphin we knew. Uh, this was a shark bite, actually three shark bites. But the lethal one was in its lower jaw. And I showed this carcass to a local fisher, and he said, Keith, look for a tooth in that lower jaw, and I can tell you, if you find a tooth, I can tell you what kind of shark it was. Well, so while we were at the necropsy, and uh, people were looking at the organs and, and doing the dissection, I was going through that injury, and darn, if I didn't find a tooth in the broken lower jaw, and there's no mistake about it, three aquarists confirmed it, uh, that's a tooth from a white shark, which is the same as a great white shark in the jaw of that dead dolphin and also in the jaw in a bone was this stingray spine oh what a horrible way to go i've been stung by stingrays twice and the um the pain is much greater than what the injury would suggest this looks like a horrible story and it is but it has a happy ending uh the good folks at uh coastal Carolina University actually performed a rescue on this young dolphin that was entangled and growing fast and every day that line was getting tight and tighter and they actually performed a rescue with fishers and biologists and veterinarians and they removed the line and were able to document that the dolphin uh, could continue a, a normal dolphin life after that. So I'm very proud of their work. Generally, we cannot save them, but we do keep trying. And all this entanglement talk inspired us 
to start in North Carolina what Florida has done well, which is um, the monofilament recovering and recycling program. So we put these receptacles, we build the receptacles and put them on beaches, docks, and piers, and we put uh, wooden box, or cardboard boxes at tackle shops, uh, encouraging people to not leave fishing line on the beach, to don't throw it in the water. When you see it, pick it up and put it in the receptacles or uh, at least in a trash can and not leave it in the environment. So I hope it's working. We started in 2007 in the bottom of this graph, 2007 is over on the left and it's been going on uh, uh, for about 13 years now. And the right axis is the uh, hundreds of uh, uh, miles of fishing line that we've collected. So I think, uh, yeah, well, we're just over 3,000 miles of fishing line, we estimate. We've collected and sent off for recycling. I hope it makes a difference. Uh, we're certainly educating people about the um, problems that discarded fishing line in the environment causes. And a necropsy, I'm not going to uh, go into this too deep, and, except just to say that this is what a necropsy looks like. And these good, talented people look at every body part, every organ, they take tissue samples, they look in the stomach, they look at the heart, they look at the brain. And in this dolphin's case, cause of death was a stingray spine in the heart. And it's unusual, but it's not an isolated case. Uh, at the CMAS lab in Moorhead City, there's a dolphin skeleton on display that demonstrates in the skeletal display a stingray spine in the rib cage. That spine was removed from one of the lungs of that dolphin. So they do, um, they do get hit by st stingray barbs lethally. And I don't want to lead you to believe this is typical. This is the most extreme case I've ever heard of, of uh, marine debris in the stomach of a bottlenose dolphin. I just took this from a marine mammal medicine book. But you'll recognize a lot of these things. Uh, a clip, lure, lens cap, lighter, pen. There are various pieces of shell and plastic. And I can't explain all this, but I do want to use this to remind me, remind you, remind our parents, remind our children that the trash that blows off our boat or off our beach back blanket or we leave on the beach can have a devastating impact on marine wildlife. This is one of the two harbor porpoises that came ashore alive in North Carolina and it died on the beach. Ari, shown there in the upper left, uh, performed the necropsy and he shared with me the results in the photo of the stomach contents. And he could actually read the labels on the wrappers of the candy um, that the wrappers came from. No food in the stomach, and there were bird feathers, and we don't think they eat birds. But again, just, a, just an example of a marine debris being consumed by uh, marine wildlife. Uh, on a lighter note, a bottlenose dolphin eating what we like to see them eat. Uh, they eat what they can swallow whole, and generally when they swallow a fish, they like to swallow it head first. So if they catch it by the tail or sideways, they'll usually flip it around. Hard to see for sure, but that's what it looks like, and it looks like it here, um, and swallow it head first, and that could be a mullet. A pair of dolphins is probably a, a dependent calf with this adult dolphin. Here's a feeding method I've never seen in North Carolina, but Lee Torres has documented in Florida where the dolphins actually collaborate, and some swim in a ring and try to spook mullet into the air, and these mullet are really hoping they can evolve into flying fish really fast before they fall into the mouth, the open mouth of that bottlenose dolphin. What a cooperative, uh, cooperative feeding effort that is, called mud ring feeding, I think, is how they refer to it. And this is something I haven't quite seen in North Carolina, but it's predictable in some of the creeks in South Carolina where bottlenose dolphins will actually chase fish up on the mud bank catch them and flop back into the water. It's a, a, a feeding technique, a cooperative feeding technique that bottlenose dolphins use down there. And uh, I've seen something close to it here, but not quite that degree. This is in the Moorhead City Turning Basin. Looks like a needlefish in the mouth of this. What is going on here? 
I call it jellyfish frisbee, but they tend to, they don't, I've never seen them throw them back and forth to each other. One dolphin will just toss one of these jellyfish, uh, cannonball jellies is a common name for them, Stomolophus is the taxonomic genus, uh, and the dolphin will just toss it sometimes pretty high and chase it down and toss it again. I've never seen a dolphin mouth it or eat it. I've never seen pieces of jellyfish in the dead dolphin's stomach. It kind of looks like fun. So maybe it is jellyfish frisbee. I don't know. Oh, there's another. But if you get a good look at these jellyfish, you will notice that it's not just a jellyfish. I mean, it is a community that's swimming around and they are always accompanied by a lot of small fish. And if you happen to have an opportunity to pick one up, either in your hands or a net, and I've never felt the sting of one, they'd have a very mild sting or it doesn't affect us. But I'm gonna show you in the next slide, this jellyfish in my hand. And I've opened up the mantle to have a peek at what's inside. And usually there's one fish inside, trigger fish, I think, and zero to one spider crabs, never two. Um, and you see a spider crab inside this one. So I don't know why the dolphins throw it, but maybe they're trying to dislodge an appetizer or maybe it's just fun. All right, what is that? That is a dolphin with a stingray in its mouth. I wouldn't have believed this if anyone told me that this happened, but that entire stingray went into the mouth of that dolphin. It is, the stingray is upside down. It's head first going into the dolphin. I don't know what species of ray it is. Uh, and it just makes me think that, is that dolphin about to consume a ray that has a barb in it that could actually be lethal? And this is the first time I've ever seen them with a ray in the mouth, but I've seen it several times since then. A couple dolphins swimming over to the boat. Who wouldn't enjoy seeing that? A uh, couple dolphins in the air. The, this is right off the museum's watercraft center in Taylor's Creek, and that's Duke Marine Lab in the background. The original and the best surfers. This is six or seven dolphins in a wave off Cape Lookout by the lighthouse. Just some fun pictures here. Bow riding uh, is a behavior when dolphins actually surf on the pressure wave created by a boat going through the water. It's a common behavior with many species of dolphins, including bottlenose dolphins. And this happened to be a shrimp trawler and a, a guy on the bows enjoying the show. My friend Nelson Owens took this picture of a couple dolphins bow riding on my uh, research boat, Spy Hop. Tail walking, not just a SeaWorld trick. Occasionally you see a dolphin actually hop up on its tail, kick a few times, do a belly flop and do it again long enough for me to get a out of focus picture. Uh, we call that tail walking. And uh, I mentioned we're here in the Bonehenge Whale Center. And uh, let me get this right. That window right there is the window you're looking at in the slide. And there's a bottle of this dolphin skeleton in it. This uh, was a dolphin that came ashore on Shackleford Banks. And we did a silly thing with it. We painted the whole skeleton and glow in the dark paint and put black lights on the window frame. You can see a black light uh, above John's hand there. And, uh, and it's all on a timer. Every sunset, the black lights come on and from the street, this is what you can see at the Bonehenge Whale Center that's not open yet, uh, but the glowing dolphin <laughs> that's painted with glow in the dark paint and illuminated with black lights above the street side. There's a close up of it. And just a, a grateful thank you to all the organizations who have collaborated regularly and or have helped with funding for everything I presented here uh, in this presentation. And I've heard, and I saw it on Facebook, so it must be true, that if you put a Protect Wild Dolphin license plate on your car, your car will go faster, last longer, you'll look younger, you'll look sexier, and it helps fund the stranding response and the research that I've presented to you today. So if you're a North Carolina driver, consider doing that for your car and yourself and 
our work and get a North Carolina Protect Wild Dolphins license plate. A sunset photo. And thanks for your interest. <laughs>